Hallelujah. Behold, He comes. The one who was, is, and is to come. Yeshua HaMashiach. Coming back to Jerusalem. What you're witnessing here, and I'd like to welcome our live stream audience now. This is the prophetic, biblical, end time revival of Israel. The prophets said it would happen, and we're Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. God took one man, Abraham, and from him he raised up a nation. He brought us out of slavery in Egypt, brought us to his holy mountain, Sinai, revealed himself to us. He separated the nation unto himself to bring forth the Savior of all nations, Yeshua. He came from the Jews, and, and Jewish people went, and they told the world. They went out through the Roman Empire. They told everybody about it. Here we are 2,000 years later, and now the good word is coming back to the people who brought it, back to the Jews. <laughs> Typically, the Lord is using non-Jewish people to bring the good news to Jewish people. That's how it happened to many of you. It happened that way to me. Uh, a family of gypsies on 4th Street in St. Petersburg told me about Yeshua back in 1991. So only the Lord could have orchestrated that one. I went to get my palm read, and then the lady said, let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> That was a surprise, but, uh, you know, you know, God, he knows how to reach you exactly where you're at. Amen. You know, you might have been drunk in a in a pub or maybe in the gutter with a needle in your arm. Anywhere you were at, the Lord knows how to reach you with the good news and to pick you up, yes. cleanse you and give you a new life. Amen. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Praise the Lord. So I'm thankful and uh, I'm excited as I am every Shabbat because uh, God is in the midst of us. It's his divine presence that makes all the difference. When you're in his presence, he just takes hold of you Amen. and he heals you and he, he supplies you. He gives you what, you're, what you need and then you go forth on Shabbat uh, feeling a whole lot different, don't you? Well, we're going to continue now with the Torah service. Page 63 and 64, as we prepare to open the ark, please rise and we'll join together with Irvin at the bottom of page 64. When the ark would travel, Moses was saying, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For from Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. By ye bin so Aaron, by Yomer Moshe, Kuma Adonai, be a food so oi becha, be a nu so mesanecha, me panecha.
כבוד. וזאת התורה אשר שם משה לבני בני ישראל על פי אדוני ביד משה. This is the Torah Moses placed before the children of Israel. By the mouth of the Lord, by the hand of Moses. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom Lekulam. Shabbat Shalom everyone. Our Parsha this week. Ve'et Chanan. We'll be reading from Deuteronomy 4 verses 1 through 4. Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 4. Ya'amor Rut Bat Michael LaTorah. Baruch Adonai Hamavarach. Baruch Adonai Hamavarach Lelam Bayed. Baruch Adonai Elohim Melech Haolam. Asherach Rabbanu Mikol Haamin. Benantan Lanu Et Torah To. Baruch Adonai Notein HaTorah. Amen. Ve'et Chanan. El Adonai Ve'et Chahu. Lemor Adoni Adonai Ata. Hachalot lehorot Abdecha et gedalcha vet yadecha Hachazaka asher miel bashamayim ubaaretz Asher yasak masecha Uchvurotecha varana Vara et haaretz Hatova asher bavor hayardein hahar atov hazeh Vehil ben cha, veyita ver Adonai bi leman chem. Amen. So, uh, I gave you the wrong verse. I read from Deuteronomy 3, 23 through 26. I pleaded with Adonai at that time, saying, O Lord Adonai, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth? who can do deeds and mighty acts like yours. Please let me cross over and see the good land across the Jordan, that good hill country and the Lebanon. But Adonai was angry with me because of you, so he would not listen to me. Enough, Adonai said to me. Do not speak to me any more about this matter. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, ashenatan lana Torah at emet, v'chai olam atah b'tochenu, Baruch atah Adonai notein ha-Torah. Amen. Amen. Mi shirei ha-chavoteinu, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, hu yavarech et rut bat Michael bati, b'shem Yeshua ha-Mashiach. May he who has blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, bless Ruth, daughter of Michael, my daughter, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. All right, good job, Ruthie. I got a little mixed up after that dance, and I read uh, a different portion in the Torah that I had prepared. <laughs> I don't often dance, you know. When the rabbi dances, y'all better watch out. Something big is going to happen. Must be some kind of sign. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, but I know the horror. That's the one thing, you know, after so many Jewish weddings. We're going to put the Torah back in the ark as we turn to page 73 and 74 for the Etz Chaim prayer. Elisa. First in the English. It is a tree of life. 
to those who take hold of it, and those who support it are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all is paths of peace. Bring us back, Lord, to you, and we shall come, renew our days as of old. Get Wonderful Shabbat Shalom! <laughs> we just know everyone's doing well, better than when you came in, right? <laughs> yes, thank you for tuning in with us. You at home here at Temple New Jerusalem, we always appreciate it. We just want you to get filled with that joy and know that there is a God who loves you, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we are one in spirit because there's one God and one people. Amen. Amen. From Romans 8, 28, it says, Now we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. His purpose, his earth, his universe, all have a divine purpose under heaven. Yes? Amen. And that includes you and me. We are beautifully and wonderfully made, and don't ever let anyone ever tell you any different. And each of you have so many gifts and talents, and you at home, so many gifts and talents to use for God's glory. No matter what it is, edify God in the way that he designed you to be. Edifying God is so, so important. So we're so glad to be here today, and we take good care of you. Afterwards, remember, we have some noshing to do uh, with some sandwiches, and we have hot chocolate and coffee and all that good stuff. We always want to say happy birthday to all July birthday babies. <laughs> and we say that we don't because everyone's included. So we just say happy birthday. So we never exclude anybody because that's, I don't want to ever do that. So anyway, praise the Lord. Um, we are winding down with our women's Bible study online. We are going into chapter 23 of chapter 24. And uh, it's exciting because now we're learning about Miriam and Martha. There's a great book called Having um, a Merry Heart in a Martha World. Yeah. No, no, that just means I think we just need to slow down a little bit more, take our time, and uh, look around. Because there's so much to see in the small stuff. <laughs> Temple Builders. I know you at home, you see some of your friends here up here. and. Uh, they're, they're so close and dear to our heart as well. And if you'd like to get involved, we do have cards to fill out called Temple Builder Cards. And uh, please fill them out and get involved from the little to the big. It doesn't matter because there's no favorites in the eyes of God. And we all, no matter if we're cleaning the floor, if we're serving food, if you're up here, we have a pure heart to serve the Lord in spirit and in truth. And he honors that greatly. So... Get involved to do something in God's house because there's always a tremendous blessing in it and you're going to bless others. That's just how it works. And um, also remember, Saturday, August 7th, the TNJ Kids Back to School Project for our local outreach is coming right around the corner. Thank you, thank you for those who may have cleaned out their garage. I know we did. <laughs> we donated a bunch of stuff that I didn't even know we had. Ah, we had this and we had that. There's folders and all kinds of loose leaf and crayons and, you know, even flash drives. We have a whole list for you on those bags because um, we're going to do a uh, drop off to the main office. We can't ever meet the clients, but we go to the main office and they get kind of 
when we're ready, when they're ready to again, they can give us a tour. But they always are so greatly appreciative. It's a real mitzvah, especially before the high holidays, which is coming around the corner. We have finalized some dates for the high holidays. Yes, we have. Uh, are they available? Okay. Yes. Miss Nancy said they are available. So yes, please grab a flyer because now's the time to go on your calendar, take some time off from work if you can. Uh, you should be able to, and all the high holiday dates are up and ready to go. And um, they're also, we're also doing a sign up sheet for a couple of things for Break the Fast, which is lots of food. So get ready. And uh, we're doing it outside, actually. Beautiful. There's going to be some lights, and we're going to have some games. It's going to be wonderful. We decorate the sukkah at that time as well. And then we have our Sukkot in the park around the corner. Yes, that's coming up. I think at the end of September. So the 26th, thank you. And um, it's from noon to 2.30. And those details are also uh, available for you. And. Um, we also just remember, we have our tithe and offering box located in the back for your convenience, for you at home. You can also do donate online. We have GiveLify, Tap, Give, and Done, and also PayPal for your convenience. The scripture verse is from Philippians 4, 19 and 20. My God will fulfill every need of yours according to the riches of his glory in Messiah Yeshua. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Continually praising the Lord. And you know, when we start to edify God, when we start to think about all the wonderful promises, we start to lose track of all our problems. <laughs> right? Because now we're thinking more this way and not so much this way. And that's a good thing. So we can focus our mind um, and just fill our heart and soul with his spirit and truth. That's always a good thing. So at this time, I won't give you any more time, but at this time, we are going to dismiss the children first. So we're going to go to the back, and parents, you are going to be signing out your kids, because we always do safety here at Temple New Jerusalem. We take it very seriously. And now, for a very power-packed message from your very own rabbi, Rabbi Mike. <laughs> So this Shabbat is called Shabbat Nachamu. It's a uh, annual thing. Nachamu means comfort, Shabbat of comfort. And it's always the, uh, the first Shabbat following Tisha B'Av, which is the ninth of Av. Uh, it's Tisha B'Av is a, which was last Sunday, is a Jewish national holiday. It's a very sad day, historically, uh, and it traditionally involves fasting and mourning uh, as it commemorates the destruction of the temple and the exile of the Jews from Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, which occurred not once but twice, first up, uh, under the Babylonians in 586 BC, and then again the Romans did it, destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in the year 70, and the Jews were carried off into exile. Some say the Romans took care to plan it on that day, on Tisha B'Av, knowing that already it was a day of destruction in Jewish history. Uh, so they doubled down on it by sacking Jerusalem on that day. But there were other tragedies, uh, interestingly, that seemed to occur on that day. Uh, one of the big ones was the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. So that's just a little bit about Tisha B'Av. But Nachamu is comfort. So it's always Tisha B'Av and then Shabbat Nachamu. Comfort. Comfort ye my people. So after the calamity has passed, we have renewed hope ahead of us for good things, for blessings from the Lord because his grace and the gift and the calling of God, his covenant is irrevocable. There is good news. God's love never ceases. As the Torah says, he will never leave you nor forsake you. So a time of rejoicing, like people at harvest, is near on Shabbat Nachmu. 
And that is very much connected to the season that's approaching in about six weeks. Comes a little early this year. And that season is the high holidays, which begins with the sounding of the shofar. That shofar right there just looks lonely, doesn't it? I want somebody to blow it. <laughs> but um, we have uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. And that's a season of judgment. It's a time of redemption of God's people. But historically, traditionally, believed to be a time of judgment, not against the Lord's people, but against wickedness and lawlessness in the earth. It's kind of like a rehearsal every year because those that season, the seventh month, the month of Tishri, which is Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, is um, approached as a time of awe, the Yomim Noraim, it's called, the days of awe. And it's believed that at the end, the Messiah will come, he will, he'll actually return, uh, but when he comes back the second time with the sounding of the great shofar, as the Psalms say, Psalm 96, Psalm 98, he is coming to judge the earth. So, and when he judges the earth, he'll redeem a people unto himself. So it's kind of re a rehearsal for that great and glorious day at the end. But it's also believed to be a season that God brings things into account and that there, it is a time of Reckoning, a time of judgment against wickedness, a time of redeeming the faithful in a lesser way, but not, you know, as compared to the end. But God, in his mercy, he sort of trains us and teaches us each year in the biblical life cycle to be ready for eternity. So the Parsha for Shabbat Nachmu is Ve'et Hanan, and here... Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8, Moses instructs the people to keep the law that the Lord has given them so that other people of the land will see their wisdom and their way of life and, and they'll be amazed. Uh, it says, see, just as the Lord my God commanded me, I have taught you statutes and ordinances to do in the land that you are about to enter to possess. You must keep and do them, for it is your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to them as the Lord our God is whenever we call on him? What great nation is there that has statutes and ordinances that are righteous? like all of this Torah that I am setting before you today. So note that what Moses advises Israel, that the nations will be most impressed about, is that Israel's God seems to be near to Israel, that he's there whenever we call on him, it says. And that's not so with the pagans and their gods of stone. The God of Israel is not carved in stone. In fact, he forbids it. And yet, and though he hides his face from all, you know, he's invisible. You can't see him. He cannot be seen. And yet his presence is so clearly there. And his presence is so real and true. He's not just a thought or a concept, but he's a living being who quite literally dwells in the midst of his people. He's doing that right here among us this morning on Shabbat. His kavod, his glory, his presence can be felt. You can feel his presence and, and often you can bear witness and see as well, the Shekinah, the divine presence when he's dwelling with his people. But the nations will also understand that God's presence among his people is quite connected to this law that he gave them. Thus, as Moses told them, and Moses advised Israel again and again that, you know, 
if, if you don't keep this law, things are going to go badly. We don't like to read that part about all the horrors that are. And then he really gets into it in Deuteronomy throughout the book, and including in this week's Parsha. But the, the nations around Israel, who he told them, they're, they're going to be, they're going to see the wisdom that God has given you. They're going to see that your God is with you, and they're going to be amazed. They're going to be impressed with you. But at the same time, they figured out that it's connected to this law so that if they don't keep this law, then it's going to go really badly for them. And that maybe they can be lured or tricked or deceived or tempted to forsake this law that God's given them and, and try the, the ways of the people of the land. Try some of their stuff. <laughs> try some of their gods and some of their, their ways and their things. And, and of course, there, there were always people that were willing to, you know, to, to taste and see, kind of like a salad bar. Give it a try. See what happens. Uh, the nations around them understood that, especially their enemies. And so it was, this is how we ended up with two exiles to begin with because the people never really kept the law that Moses gave them and told them, keep this and you'll be, you'll be under God's blessing. And then the truth is nobody could, no nation could. So, but we have this principle, as long as the divine presence of the Lord is in the camp, then things go exceedingly well. But when people lose faith and go after the ways or the gods of the people of the land, the divine presence departs and the barn door is left wide open to the enemy. See, the problem is that no nation or society or individual can walk perfectly in the law. But God sent his son to fulfill for Israel and for all mankind the very purpose set forth in the Torah which is that the, the dwelling place of God is to be with men. He wants to dwell among us. And when he does, we're blessed. And he wants that for us because he loves us. He loves us all. God and his people as one, this is God's will. And the, and the people then are at peace with one another. Yeshua never leaves the barn door open. He's without blemish, without sin. And all who enter by him are his sheep. He keeps us in the way. He cleanses the sinner. He will never cast us out. He will never refuse us. You know, anyone who came to Yeshua for healing, you know what he did? He said, well, let me talk with you first about some of these things you're doing wrong. <laughs> no, that wasn't what he did. <laughs> He didn't make inquiry. He didn't set forth conditions. He healed them. Now, sometimes he'd say, go and sin no more. Sometimes he'd say, does anyone condemn you now? Well, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Amen. He wasn't okay with sin. But the New Testament teaches all have sinned. All have come short of the glory of God. So anyone who comes to him, he heals them. And you walk away saying, I'm a new creation in Mashiach Yeshua. That's the spiritual rebirth. And unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The law has a place and purpose, but it, it can't do that for us. For one thing, it depends on us. But Yeshua is God. The new covenant depends on God. And it's our faith in him that makes all the difference. So here in the Parsha, Moses reminds Israel of perhaps the most important thing at that moment before going in to possess the land for Israel to remember and learn from the Torah. Remember Choreb. Choreb is Mount Sinai. It's another name for Mount Sinai. Remember what happened there. Deuteronomy 4, 11 through 16, Moses continues. You came near and stood at the bottom of the mountain while the mountain was blazing with fire up to the heart of the heavens. 
darkness, cloud, and fog. Adonai spoke to you from the midst of the fire. The sound of words you heard, but a form you did not see, only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to do. The ten words is, is the ten commandments, as it's usually called, but it is more accurately translated the ten words, the aseret hadvarim. Other, uh, sometimes it's called the aseret hadibrot, the feminine form, which is, it literally means the ten words because the whole thing about the Ten Commandments, it's not that they're the greatest commandments. There's, you know, there's 613 commandments in the Torah. That's a lot of commandments. The Ten are usually set apart, and rightfully so, but it isn't necessarily that they're the greatest. They certainly are among them. They're not the greatest. What are the greatest commandments? Love the Lord with all your God. Excuse me, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself, which is actually part of this week's Parsha from Deuteronomy 6, but not part of the Ten. Um, but really, the important thing about the Ten Commandments is that they were set apart from the other 600 in three in that the whole nation of Israel heard the voice of the Lord speak these ten. That's why they're called the Ten Words, not the Aseret HaMitzvot which would be Ten Commandments, but the Ten Things, the Ten Things that you heard God say. You heard the voice of the Lord. No, under, no other nation has heard God speak as a nation. They saw the divine presence. They saw the glory, the fire, the, the smoke, the cloud, and they heard his voice. And Moses is reminding them, remember Horeb, that's the main thing. Now, all this law that I'm giving you, it'll go a lot better for you. If you remember Choreb and live in the divine presence. Because if we can live in the divine presence, the rest of it is gravy. The, the fruit naturally grows from the vine that, that is in the branch that's dwelling in the vine. You know, the fruit comes forth. But we, if we put the cart before the horse, it doesn't really work that way. Then we end up with a vine that's broken off. That was kind of the way Yeshua put it. But, but uh, Choreb, or Sinai, the ten words, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And, you know, the fact that he wrote them down, I think people kind of got the wrong message. Like, oh, these are the most important commandments. They are very important. Uh, but, but then... It's the reason he wrote them down was as a memorial of what happened there. One nation was set apart from all nations because that nation became a witness, a witness of God's voice and of his glory. And no other nation that has ever experienced anything like that. And the whole point of setting a nation apart was to bring forth the savior of all nations. <laughs> And, and we, the Jewish nation, we, we've sat there for centuries and centuries and said, oh, no, no, no. he came from us, but he's not the Messiah. He's not the Savior. <laughs> now we're coming back to reality on that one. It's, a, it's an odd thing. You know, a, a prophet is not without honor except among his own family and friends. And uh, Yeshua raised up thousands and thousands in his generation that were Jewish that went forth and told the good news to the world. But then it just kind of became known as a Gentile thing somehow. That you couldn't be Jewish and believe in Jesus. But being Jewish and believing in Jesus is the most Jewish thing a Jew can do. As he, you know, after all, he, he is Jewish. <laughs> but he didn't come for us. Only he came for the, the nations. He came for all peoples. And he loves everyone. He did set apart one nation, though. And that's what's really going on here at Sinai. Uh, so, verse 14, the Lord commanded me at that time, teach you statutes and ordinances so you might do them in the land you're crossing over to possess. Be very watchful over your souls since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. See, we, we couldn't carve a graven image if we wanted to. I mean, what would he look like? 
You know, good thing they didn't have digital cameras back then. But e even that wouldn't have, wouldn't have done it, you know? Um, that's the way God wanted it. Amen. So, out of the midst of the fire, so that you do not act corruptly and make for yourselves a graven image in the likeness of any figure, the form of a male or female. So Moses, after the Ten Commandments, which all of Israel heard, now the thing changed where Moses would hear from God and he wrote down all the other things that God said. And the reason that it went like that, that the rest of the Torah was written by Moses in, not in the hearing of the rest of Israel was because of what happened at Horeb, Exodus 20, 18, 19. All the people witnessed the thundering, Exodus 20, verse 18, 19. All the people witnessed the thundering and the lightning and the sound of the shofar and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood far off. So they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak to us or we will die. <laughs> and, and the Lord just kind of said, as you wish, because from then on, they didn't hear from him anymore. They just had had Moses meet with God and he wrote down everything God said, which was pretty cool. And he came down the mountain and gave it to him. Moses himself heard from the Lord, but not everyone else. They didn't want to. There's something about our nature that objects to being too close to the Lord. Something about our nature, we really have to learn this, you know, because we're not even normally aware of it. It sneaks right up on us. And it's tricky, I think, because this thing I'm speaking about is often the very thing that acts like, oh, I'm so into God. <laughs> but there's something about our nature that doesn't really want to be in the presence of the Lord. And it would rather glorify itself, frankly. Um, but, it's, but it's a little deeper than that. It's, it, it's something about our nature that fears because it knows that we're unworthy to be in the presence of the Lord. And it's true, we are, we all are. The law, which this thing that I'm speaking of would much rather do the law because the law is about the thing. The law is about our nature. Oh, I'll do that all day, give it to me, you know? Show me, uh, you know, what I'm supposed to do and I'll do it, except I won't, but I, exactly. I'll have a, you know, a good time pretending. <laughs> and don't think I'm one of those, you know, let's throw the law in, in down the drain people. I'm not. God gave the law and it's, it's, the law is perfect and it's good and it's wise and we should learn it and aspire to live by it and teach it to our children. But don't be deceived. That's not going to get you into the end zone. The one who was perfect in the law, he will. And there's kind of this clash going on. Um, the law could not set us right, but Yeshua HaMashiach can. And he will. Because we are a new creation in Messiah. There's an internal war going on in each and every one of us. The new birth in Messiah is the victory. Amen. And uh, when we've come to be born of the spirit of the Lord, the new self, as Paul called it, you know, you know, he talked about the old self, the new self. Some, some say the old man and the new man. Um, you can't say man anymore, so, <laughs> which I'm, I'm good with that, you know. I'm okay with that. Huh? You know, like you can't say, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. You have to say, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. I'm okay with that. 
We don't want to lead the ladies out. <laughs> but um, I don't want to get off topic here. <laughs> I just think it's weird when people get offended about that stuff. But, but let's just talk about the new self, the old self. Paul talked about that a lot. And he, he understood it because he was a religious hero. He was a superstar Torah master raised at the feet of Gamaliel, who was a, one of the greatest of the rabbis of that time. And, and Shaul, as he was known, uh, was, was on his way, man. I mean, he, was, he might have been the next Rabban, as Gamaliel was known. Rabban means like the great rabbi, because he was raised at his feet. He was actually greater than Gamaliel, but, you know, in a different way, and wouldn't have been recognized in that way by the the group that he came from, from Pharisaic Judaism, he understood the new self. He was, he would, you know, he would say, Paul would say, it's, no, it's no longer I who lives, but Mashiach living in me. The new self, as he called it, knows that we're made the righteousness of God by faith in the one who was out blemish. There's no fear. When we have faith in Yeshua, there's none of this feeling that our human nature has it. I just, I, I can't be in God's presence. You know, that's why the children of Israel said, no, Moses, you go and talk with God. That's for us. We don't want to hear it anymore, lest we die. You know, in a more practical sense, it's, it's something that keeps you from coming to Shabbat. I'm preaching to the wrong people this morning. <laughs> Maybe you hadn't been here in a while. It's you I'm speaking to. <laughs> but, it, you know, it keeps you from being too involved in that. You know, it, it gives you a whole lot of reasons why. That's one way that it can work. Well, there's no fear in him. I think a lot of people feel, and, and sometimes consciously, sometimes it's not even a, a conscious thing that they're aware of, they feel that I'm not really worthy to be in God's presence, you know. And when God's presence falls in a place, that's the last place you might want to be if you feel like that. But Yeshua takes away that fear. He takes away that Anxiety. He takes away that objection, whatever way that it may come. He takes it away because in him who was without sin, we are made the righteousness of God. And, and, there's, and God's love is perfected in the fact that he sent his son. Perfect love casts out fear. If we only we could know how much God loves us. In this Parsha, we have the greatest commandment that comes from Deuteronomy 6. You shall love the Lord your God. We, we do it every Shabbat. Love him with all your heart, soul, and strength. It's the most important commandment. I hadn't met anyone to do it yet. <laughs> Nobody loves the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and strength. Nobody could ever do it. Or your neighbor as yourself. But we do aspire to. We hear that. Yeah, that's really how it should be. But, but the more we realize that he loved us first. You see? If we, we love God, it's because we know he loved us first. So much that he suffered for us on a tree. He was abused and tortured. And humiliated in the streets of Jerusalem. And crucified. He didn't have to go through any of that. He could have snapped his finger. And called down 12 legions of angels. And turned the whole world right side up. For a while. But he endured all that. So that he could redeem unto himself a people. And when we realize that. Wow God. He loves me. He loves us that much. Then we realize he loves us first. Then we begin to love him back. 
It starts with him, though. We begin to love him, but never perfectly. Not with all of our heart, soul, but more and more. Instead of the way we're born, we love ourselves. And, uh, and your mom and dad play into that. <laughs> because, um, you know, they think you're God's gift and, and they teach you how special you are. And that, see, that's normal. I mean, maybe you had a mom and dad that, you know, told you what a loser you were and beat you up and stuff. Some, some people had that. Uh, or maybe you had one that loved you so much, uh, and, but, but you had to be a certain way. So it was a little of both. Like, I love you, but you better stop doing that, buddy, or I'm going to make you pay. <laughs> That's kind of how it was for me. It was good, but it was, you know, it was like a mix of, condemnation for the sake of making me better and um, and we get that drilled into us from the youngest age and we we begin to think how special we are but then but to love God and to love others as much as you know to love your neighbor as yourself that's not something that's natural to human beings but when we realize that God loved us first when we're born again when we're born of the Spirit of God it changes Everything, it changes the flow. So we know God, I know God loves me, so bang, it, it bounces right back to him. Like, you know, like an echo chamber, like a light on a great mirror. It bounces back, but it's his love. He is love anyway. <laughs> it's his, his essence, it's what he is. And then we also can love our, can love our neighbor as ourselves if we're a new creation in Messiah. There's no fear in him. We can be in the presence of the Lord, in the divine presence, as Israel was at Choreb. There's unimaginable strength and power because all authority is vested in the Son of God. In all the heavens, among the principalities and powers, and in all the earth, among kings and princes, there's no other authority besides the Son of God. All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. That was his last word before he went up into the heavens. God is in control. He lets the devil have his day for a while. As with Tisha B'Av. But things are not as they appear. In fact, the arms of the wicked will be broken. Yeshua has it all. He has total authority. He shares that with those who are joint heirs together with him. Ephesians 1, 19-23. You know, the same spirit that raised him from the dead is with us. And what is his exceedingly great power toward us who keep trusting him in keeping with the working of his mighty strength. This power he exercised in Messiah when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heaven. He is far above any ruler, authority, power, leader, and every name that is named. Not only in the Olam Hazeh, which means this world, but also in the Olam Haba, which is the world to come. God placed all things under Messiah's feet and appointed him as head over all things for his community, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So it is, there's one God, one body, one Lord <clears throat> and Savior of us all. The Torah in this week's Parsha coins a phrase that's very common in, in Jewish lore. Um, it's a very common thing in Jewish tradition. Ein od milvado. There is none like him. Amen. The gods of the world are not gods at all. They're images, illusions. There's one God and there's none else. And Yeshua... 
God's son, came from Israel. This is why Israel was set apart. And so Moses tells Israel in this parsha, Deuteronomy 4, 32 through 35, indeed ask now about the former days that were before you. From the day that God created man on earth and asked from one end of the sky to the other. Has there ever been such a great thing as this? Or has anything like it ever been heard? Has a people ever heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you have heard and lived? Remember I said the Ten Commandments. What's the thing about the Ten Commandments? They heard God's voice. And see, Moses goes on to explain that in this parsha. Has any God ever tried to come to take for himself a nation from within a nation by trials, by signs and wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and outstretched arm, and by great terrors, like all that Adonai your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? You were shown so that you might know that Adonai is God. Enod milvado. There is no other besides him. So as I had opened with Shabbat Nachmu means comfort. And following the sadness of Tisha B'Av, Shabbat Nachmu is a celebration of all the good that is about to come. Isaiah 40, 1 and 2. This is where the idea for Shabbat Nachmu comes. Nachmu, Nachmu Ami. It says, comfort, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak kindly to the heart of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was just destroyed. We just remembered the destruction of Jerusalem, the, the sacking of the temple, the exile of the people. Speak kindly to the heart of Jerusalem. How many of you know there's a time to favor Zion? Yes. This is it. Amen. <laughs> God's favor is upon Israel and Jerusalem and all who stand with Israel and who pray for Jerusalem or under his blessing, under his grace, because that's where the fountain is flowing. Proclaim to her, her warfare has ended, and that her iniquity has been removed, for she has received from Adonai's hand double for all her sins. So the Romans doubled down on destroying the temple on Tisha B'Av. And but it says her warfare is ended. Her iniquity has been removed. That's how the warfare ends. It ends when your iniquity is removed. How does that happen? When we put our faith in Yeshua, he removes our sins. This is the day of the Jewish nation's revival and restoration. The dry bones live. But it's also the day that Jewish people are returning to faith in Yeshua. You can't say anymore, it isn't Jewish to believe in Jesus. You can't say that anymore. There's just too many of us. And we're growing in number every day. Not only in the diaspora, but in Eretz Yisrael as, as well. And the Lord is fulfilling his end time plan in this is the day of God's favor upon Zion. We received double for all of our sins in the past, but now Israel is doubly blessed. And you're doubly blessed if you stand with Israel. Doubly blessed. Ain't no doubt about it. We're doubly blessed. Because when we come to Yeshua, we come to another mountain, Amen. an unshakable kingdom. This is my last scripture, Hebrews 12, 18, 24. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and storm and to the blast of a shofar and voice whose words made those who heard it beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. So terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm quaking with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, 
to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, a joyous gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are written in a scroll in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous ones made perfect, and to Yeshua, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of something better than the blood of Abel. You may not realize it, but we stand before that mountain now, Mount Zion. The Lord is at God's right hand, and this is, there is their eternal life to all who are his. And rest, even in this stormy, perishing world. You're doubly blessed. So take comfort. Comfort ye, my people. Shabbat shalom. Praise the Lord. Well, we've had a, another wonderful Shabbat this morning at TNJ, and uh, we're going to say a blessing now over the wine and bread. I want to encourage you to um, give generously to this work. You can do that by the box in the back, or you can give online uh, via PayPal and our other link called GiveLify. Just go to templenj.org slash donate. And uh, you'll be blessed when you sow into something big that God is doing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Peri Hagafen B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, who created the fruit of the vine, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'alam ha'motzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth in the name of Jesus our Messiah. Amen. Please rise for the ironic benediction. Yivarechech Adonai v'yishmorecha. Yair Adonai panavi lecha vichunecha. Isa Adonai panavi lecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you his peace in Yeshua's name. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.